My dear professor, may I ask what you're watching? Shh. I'm trying to shoot some cycloids. The so-called curves, or cycloids, have been known for many hundreds of years. Our expert, Dr. Ezani, is now going to explain the mathematics of cycloids. He will also mention some interesting characteristics of these curves, which have got absolutely nothing to do with rolling wheels. So, sit back and relax. Hello, I'm Darius Shasani. Today you will learn about curves, which are also known as cycloids. These cycloids are described by points on a rolling wheel. In the simplest case, the wheel will roll on a flat surface. At first, I will derive for you the curve describing a cycloid, which in fact is not as complicated as one would think. Then I'll discuss a mathematical question, which seemingly has nothing to do with cycloids. In particular, which form or which shape a slide should have on which a sliding body reaches a given point in the shortest amount of time. But the key word here lies in seemingly. In fact, this question, or rather the answer, has a lot to do with cycloids. In deriving the path of a motion of a point on a circle, it will help us to use vectors to describe position, since we can always add vectors. The rolling motion will then be composed of two parts, the forward linear motion of the middle point of the circle, and the rotation of the observed point on the edge of the circle around this middle point. Mathematically, we describe the rolling wheel as a circle with a radius r, which is rolling along a straight line. The points given by p describe the unit circle. Let's begin with phi equal to zero. That's the bottommost point. After all, sine of zero is zero, and cosine of zero is one. As phi increases, P moves clockwise. For a radius other than 1, we simply multiply the point P with a factor of r. To begin with, we'll concern ourselves with the motion of the center of the wheel. It's a simple forward motion in the x-coordinate. The y-coordinate, or r, says that the center of the wheel has a constant height, which is given by the radius, above the rolling surface. The rolling surface itself we define to be y equals zero. Of course, the wheel should not be slipping as if it's rolling on ice. Instead, it will be neatly rolling forward. One full turn of the wheel corresponds to the entire circumference being covered, which causes the center of the wheel to move forward by 2pr. And thus we have the equations for the forward motion as well as for the rotation. The cycloid is simply the sum of the two. Here we see a cycloid which is generated by setting r equals to 1. Finally, we'd like to know what is the path traveled by a point which does not lie on the periphery of the wheel. Think in this case of something like the valve on a bicycle wheel tire. Here, the radius of the rotating point differs from the wheel radius. We'll call the radius of the rotating point rp. The equations have to be modified in this case, so that rp is used for the rotation, but for the forward motion, we'll hold on to the wheel radius r. We call such a curve the trochoid. Mathematically speaking, rp can also be bigger than r, which leads to a looping type effect. In reality, such a large protrusion would naturally be disruptive to a rolling motion. Now we'll come to other curves, which are formed when the rolling surface is no longer a line, but another circle. When one circle rolls on the outside of another, an epicycloid is formed. The determining factor for the form of the curve is the proportion of the radii, r1 to r2. With a proportion of whole numbers, such as 1 to n, we have a curve with an n-fold symmetry. Here you see the proportion 1 to 4. The curve looks like a four-leaf clover. 
but other proportions lead as well to very beautiful symmetric curves. Probably the best known epicycloid is the cardioid. It's produced when the two radii are of the same length. It owes its name to its heart-like shape. In this case, we can also vary the length of the rotating poles. The resulting curves we call epitrochoids. If the length of the pole is bigger than the radius of the rolling circle, once again we have looping curves. In this way, one can produce many lovely patterns. The third type of cycloid we'll see are the hypocycloids. They're formed like the epicycloids in that the rolling surface is another circle, but in this case, the rolling circle lies within another circle. Here's one. Here, it looks as if something went wrong. I don't see any curve, just a red line. As it seems, with the special choice of parameters, the hypocycloid looks something similar to a line. But how could that be? Let's change the length of the pole. As you see, the curve according to a proportion of radii from 1 to 2 is always an ellipse. The length of the pole influences the major and minor axes of the ellipse. And when s is equal to r1, the vertical axis of the ellipse is exactly 0. This curve, which looks like a line, is really just mathematically a degenerate ellipse. Here's another cycloid in which the proportion of the radii is 1 to 3. If we vary the length of the pole, we see another interesting effect. The resulting curves, which are called hypotrichoids, look as if they consist of straight segments. In this way, we can consider many similar curves, curves of pure aesthetic value or curves with practical applications. But for now, let's have a look at other problems. We want now to build a slide, and not just any slide, but the fastest. The question is therefore, what curve form B should the slide have so that a sliding body travels from smart point P1 to its end point P2 in the shortest amount of time? You can guess the answer. It is a cycloid. And why? You can read about that in the ebook. It's not possible to explain in two minutes, but it's worth the effort, especially if you want to learn something about the calculus of variations. We'll take a practical approach. You see here three ball tracks. One is a straight line, and two have the form of a cycloid. We want to show that while the straight line is the shortest, by far it's not the fastest. The tracks in the form of cycloids have another second interesting property. If one wants to calculate how long it takes for a ball to travel from an arbitrary starting point, B of phi 1, to its end point, or its low point, B of P, then one notates the formula. The time is dependent on the curve itself, but not on the chosen starting point. As the ball always takes the same amount of time to reach the end, we call this track form a tautochrome. Tauto is Greek and means the same. Chronos means time. We will try this out through an experiment in which we drop the balls from different heights on the cycloid tracks. And that brings me to the conclusion. I hope that your interest is sparked to learn more about cycloids. Research for yourself the different types of curves with the accompanying interactive tool. Read the ebook, and if you like, try the self test. Goodbye.